Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Sam S. Stryker. I'm the faculty director of the NYU Center for Labor and Employment Law. Uh, this is a very special program that's been put together by some of the, the leading experts in the field. And by the field here, we mean the neurological issues, challenges uh, for uh, accommodation, for diversity, for inclusion. Uh, and it, it, this is like a... Uh, this is above 10, it's like 10 squared, the 10 squared panel. Um, I, I'm actually not gonna have a very active role. Uh, Steve Sonnenberg will, Steve Sonnenberg is the moderator. Steve is a member of our advisory board for the center. Uh, and much of our instruction programs are actually done by the members of the advisory board. Steve was a colleague of mine uh, at Paul Hastings, very highly regarded a defense side um, employment lawyer, but he brought special skills to the job because for many years, he was a clinical social worker. So he understands some of the difficult uh, human relations issues in employment law, in employment law. Uh, he has, a couple of years ago, he left Paul Hastings and he's now full-time mediator and arbitrator for JAMS. Uh, where he's been uh, remarkable, not remarkably, but uh, expectedly successful. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Uh, if there's any information about uh, CLE, I think Allison Shafini, our, our director, our manager, will, will come in in the middle and, and make announcements about that. It's all yours, Steve. Thanks very much, Sam, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, uh, and uh, remarkably, really, what's remarkable is that actually that was about almost more than five years ago uh, when I joined JAM. So time flies. So I have the pleasure of um, first just providing brief introductions that only capture just a, a little bit about each of the individuals who are on the panel here today. Um, so first, uh, as to Scott Robertson, who is a senior policy advisor in the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the US Department of Labor and is a self-described autistic adult. He spearheads ODEP's work to foster neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, quite interestingly, um, he also um, is a founding vice president of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, a national nonprofit organization. Um, he has a PhD in information sciences and technology, a master's degree in human computer interaction, and a bachelor's degree in computer science. Barbara Hoey is chair of the labor and employment group at Kelly Dry. And uh, Barbara's experience involves litigating high profile, important matters, employment matters, and counseling clients in all areas of employment law. Um, she defends employers, uh, and she has litigated and won more than a dozen jury and bench trials involving claims under Title VII and the ADA and a variety of other discrimination and uh, employment laws. Craig Lean, who is a partner at k l Gates, is in their Washington, D.C. office, and he's a member of the Labor Employment and Workplace Safety Practice Group, also co-leads that firm's OFCCP and Affirmative Action Compliance area of focus. Before doing all of that, Craig served as director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs uh, at the U.S. Department of Labor. And uh, noting, noting, he's noted in his biography that during uh, his tenure, uh, OFCCP experienced record years in both enforcement recoveries and compliance assistance. Um, he oversaw three rulemakings and issuance of several technical assistance guides to help employers. Also with us today is Holly May. And um, Holly is the Executive Vice President and Global Chief of Human Resource Officer at the Walgreens Boots Alliance. Now, I learned earlier today, just doing a little bit of research on the internet, that there are 300, approximately 325,000 team members of the Walgreens Boots Alliance in nine countries. So 
Um, Holly, I imagine, is a very busy person like the rest of our panel members. She's responsible for the strategy and direction of innovative global human resources programs and policies and practices that support the Walgreens Boots Alliance um, overall. And uh, with that, we're going to move right into the, the topic. I have just a few, a few introductory comments I wanted to make. One of them has to do with CLE credit. Allison is going to uh, come on here in about 50 minutes or so, and she's going to provide everybody with a, uh, a code for the CLE credit. I understand that it's approved for one CLE professional practice uh, credit, but that uh, uh, NYU is in talks with the uh, with the board about uh, getting some DEI or at least a half a DEI credit as well. Okay, so on to the substance. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is just not about people of color, race, gender, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and physical disability. It includes neurodiversity, and that involves a a wide range of mental orientations, which our panel is going to talk all about. But I wanna throw out just a few statistics without vouching for the accuracy of any of them. Nevertheless, they're interesting. Estimates vary for different neurodiversity types, age groups, regions, and geographies. But there's a 2022 study by Deloitte that relies on statistics from sources that are as varied as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, and the Dyslexia Association of India. And that study states that roughly 10 to 20% of the global population is considered neurodivergent. There's another study by Corn Ferry that asserts that roughly 1% of the population is autistic, and up to 2% of the population has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, some other statistics in the United States is estimated that 85% of people on the autism spectrum are unemployed compared to roughly 4% of the overall population. And when they are working, even highly capable neurodiverse people are often underemployed. In other words, this is not an issue that focuses on a small number of people or a narrow segment of the workforce. Now, if that isn't enough reason to focus on this topic, here's a particularly hopeful perspective. Neurodiversity may very well be a competitive advantage. One study that I looked at describes neurodiversity in the workplace as, quote, an untapped superpower. With all this in context, all of this as context, um, our panel is going to address several issues, including recruiting, hiring, training, accommodation, privacy interests, and the development of successful programs to attract and retain neurodiverse individuals. And of course, some of the applicable laws. So with that, let's start with a simple question, seemingly simple question. What is neurodiversity? Scott? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, and that's a great question. And I always like to provide uh, a visual, short visual description myself first. Uh, I'm an autistic white man with blue eyes, brown hair and glasses, wearing a blue shirt and dark jacket. Um, I, and I have the Department of Labor background uh, behind me. Um, and Autism actually, the latest estimates suggest that it might likely, the prevalence is, is likely uh, around 2% actually here and maybe potentially higher actually in the United States in terms of some of the latest uh, studies. Um, it's a little bit harder to track adults at times than, than kids, but that's what we're moving toward in terms of uh, the latest research suggesting it's about one out of every 50 folks as a subpopulation of what I'm gonna describe as neurodivergence. So neurodiversity, and I always help, I always find it helpful to define neurodiversity from a concrete frame of reference. Neurodiversity refers to diverse ways in which all people, humans, may think, learn, and perceive the world in diverse ways. We all have diverse brains, just as we have other facets of diversity that we carry in our lived experiences, such as race, ethnic background, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. And our diverse ways to think, learn, and perceive the world around us 
really help enhance our society and the workplace just in the same way that biodiversity fosters great richness here on planet Earth. So diverse animals, plants, and other organisms in rich, rich ecosystems help ensure our interconnected planet continue, continually thrive and sustain nature. And so in the same way, neurodiversity helps empower workplaces and a subgroup of neurodiversity is folks who are neurodivergent, uh, for instance, autistic people like myself, who think, learn, and perceive the world atypically and process information very differently than other folks. And when I say atypically, if you do cognitive assessments, if you have automated systems, et cetera, we are the outliers. We are the ones on intelligence tests, other testing, who show up on the outer extremes. If you look at my IQ testing, it's all over the map. We call it peaks and valleys, for instance. And that's because our brains are very structurally and functionally operating differently than a lot of other folks. Other key examples of neurodivergence are ADHD, as was mentioned, dyslexia, uh, intellectual disability, mental health conditions, um, a lot of different uh, conditions and disabilities that we think of uh, for diversity, again, in the brain that are uh, common cognitive disabilities and sometimes less common cognitive disabilities. But what unites us is that we all face challenges to attain employment that matches their talents, skills, and gifts. And I think it was really great, Steve, that you had pointed out that that's a major barrier that we're going to be discussing uh, later on in the panel session. And I just wanted to mention, and we'll be highlighting it more later on too, is we have a neurodiversity in the workplace guide here at the Office of Disability Employment Policy from our employer TA center, askearn.org. And I'll be seeing if I can put the link either in chat or you can just find it directly by going to askearn.org. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Before I turn to Barbara with, an, with another um, seemingly impossible question to answer in just a few minutes, I, I want to mention that in, uh, if uh, attendees have questions, uh, we ask that you please use the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, um, not the chat feature. So just put those questions into the Q&A feature. All right, so um, what are the applicable laws? Barbara, can you give us a brief overview? Thanks, Steve. And um, I'm going to assume, actually having looked at the audience, um, that most of you are, are pretty sophisticated. And I don't want to spend a lot of time because we have a lot of, we're going to be going into a lot of the le legal and practical aspects during the presentation. And I'm not going to give you too much of a preview. But as most of you know, there is a federal law overlying all of this, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1991 and amended in 2008. Um, and the amendment is important because the amendment was really intended to and did broaden the definition of disability to the point where I tell most clients that it's not really something to debate whether the person has a disability. If they have some sort of a diagnosis, we can usually assume that it's going to pass the test under federal law. Also, mo most states have state laws and many localities like New York, where, where I'm personally based, ha have local laws that actually go beyond the federal law in terms of what the definition of disabilities are and what the accommodations are. And the, the thing about the ADA that I think makes it very different from Title VII and other discrimination laws is those laws tell you what you cannot do. You can't discriminate. The ADA was really the first law that also imposed an affirmative obligation on companies to accommodate people with disabilities. And I know it goes back a long time, but it was new at the time. It was a concept of now you need to do something affirmative for these individuals to make the workplace um, accessible to them. And we all learned early on that it's not just about the physical workplace. It's about amending or changing job responsibilities. It's about being flexible in terms of hours. It's about things beyond. It's easy to widen a doorway. It's not so easy to get a manager to understand that someone who has is neurodiverse or has some other kind of maybe not obvious challenge needs some accommodation. Um, of course, with that, you know, the, the law still protects employers and gives employers the right to determine what are essential job functions. That's going to be covered today to determine what accommodations go beyond what you can 
reasonably provide, that being the standard, and also your rights when you when it comes to the point where you might have to discipline or terminate someone who has violated a rule or is simply not meeting standards. But those are the aspects of the, the major aspects of the law. And I think the, the biggest challenge of these laws is balance. It's balancing uh, your obligation to accommodate with your need to run your business and also with the sometimes the rights of other employees who will sometimes we're going to talk I think we're going to try to talk about that you will find other employees sometimes feeling let's just say put upon or not understanding why standards are lessened or standards are different for others um and, and that is the the two minute uh lesson on something that could actually take an entire law school course um Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. No um, problem. So, Holly, why should employers bring on neurodiverse workers? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here as this is a topic I'm very personally passionate about. Uh, I would start by saying this makes business sense. Uh, teams that include both neurodivergent and neurotypical talent they have the ability to look at problems from different angles, to leverage more varied strengths uh, within the team, and also envision new possibilities. And they've really been shown to be able to solve problems faster. And I will tell you, uh, as the mother of a child who is on the autism spectrum, my son's problem solving capabilities are unlike anything I have ever seen and far beyond his five years. Um, I would also say that one of our partner organizations, Neurodiversity in the Workplace, has reported a 94% retention rate over five years with those individuals hired through their programs at the companies that they've supported. And a Deloitte study actually shows that diverse organizations, and in particular, those that value cognitive uh, diversity, are better at attracting millennial and Gen Z talent. So all of these things uh, really factor into the results of an organization in the bottom line. I would say at Walgreens Boots Alliance, our corporate vision is to be the leading partner in reimagining local health care and well-being for all. And a core pillar of this is our commitment to a healthy and inclusive workplace. And aligned to that corporate vision, we have a commitment to increasing the representation of people with disabilities. Uh, and that provides sustainable work to an underrepresented community addressing several social determinants of health, including economic instability, social isolation, and unemployment. And this is a core element of our health equity strategy, which is a key priority for our organization. And that leads us right to issues having to do with how do, how do companies attract, how do companies hire um, uh, neurodivergent workers? What are the considerations? So um, when it comes to recruiting and hiring processes, Scott, what have been, what have been some of the impediments to reaching the neurodivergent workforce, potential workforce? So I'd say one of the impediments uh, is that sometimes uh, managers never see us because we never get past the, the screening process in HR because of the interview process is so dependent socially on kind of socially wowing folks. A lot of folks can do the job, but may uh, make a typical eye contact, may not make eye contact at all. It may bear no relevance at all to actually being able to perform the work, often does not. Uh, but it's these traditions that date back, what, 200 years, 300 years or whatever in, in our interview style in the, in the workplace that really create complexity uh, for folks. Uh, some of these other things as far as being able to simply enter into work is that sometimes folks also may need some tips in terms of enhancing resumes, in terms of making sure you show all your strengths, skills, and talents. Some folks hold back and they're like, they don't realize that certain things are, are relevant as far as skills and talents to help neurodivergent folks understand that that model. 
And, and also uh, sort of self-promoting type of thing is, is learning sort of skills in terms of how you highlight yourself and your strengths and talents and the value that you bring to their workplace. And I think these things and other things have hindered uh, the, the full access to the workplace for neurodivergent neuro folks. And then I'm, I'm really glad, Holly, that you mentioned the retention aspect as far as too, is because a lot of folks sometimes are able to enter into employment. But one of the reasons that was mentioned earlier as far as the underemployment and unemployment it is a lot of neurodivergent folks like myself are sometimes able to attain employment, but it only lasts for seven months, nine months. And then folks find social complexity in the workplace. They find challenges in executive functioning, et cetera, without support. And then they're not able to stay in the job and not advance in their careers. And so that's important also for the hiring recruitment process is to be thinking proactively about that too. Not only how you can support entryway for folks who think diverse ways um, like myself and have atypical ways of processing in the world, but also thinking about what you're going to be doing for supports to make sure you can keep that person too. That you because it is it is hard. It costs a lot of money to be hiring folks continuously, right? So it's a win-win for employers when they're thinking about hiring and recruitment to be thinking intentionally about their retention aspect. And in many cases, low-cost supports uh, and and sometimes often no cost to them, just change in attitudes and perspectives that can help with retaining folks um, and and. This entails often these trainings for managers and HR folks. Uh, and, and a lot of folks still have a lot of many myths about neurodiversity and thinking and learning because these things are not concrete to folks. Like my brain, you all can't see my brain right now, right? You can't see any of your other brains because brains are not visible to folks. And, and I think that hinders the ability for folks to see what's going on with someone. So folks often make assumptions based on nonverbal communication, body language, other things and they see oddities quirks or whatever and they don't bring that person in or they have trouble keeping that person on board in the workplace and it's a major challenge and so i think we need to make inroads on this and make improvements okay and I, would, I would add something there too if it's okay steven you know the yeah, the um you know, scott and i worked together quite a while um when i was at the department of labor and he's absolutely right but you know i want to i want to emphasize one point, you know, all of those things that Scott said that companies should do, they're not doing generally. Most are not. Now, uh, Walgreens may be, and there are some that are, but only 5% of, um, you know, major companies include disability in their diversity, equity, and inclusion program. Uh, most companies are not targeting the people with disabilities at all. Federal contractors are supposed to, under the Rehabilitation Act, Section 503, and they're supposed to be trying to get up to 7%, but a lot of those processes they do are fairly rote. They're, 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 they're not uh, bespoke, they're not uh, unique, they're not focused on, certainly they're not on neurodivergent workers, maybe on disability generally. And so, you know, that's where you gotta start, acknowledging that neurodiversity exists, have a neurodiversity at work program, have speakers like Scott or like Holly or Barbara or myself come and speak to you about it, read about it, go to earn. Um, and the, the link is here on the, in the chat and, and look at a neurodiversity in the workplace program and start targeting the hiring of people with disabilities. You've already had several of us attest to the skills and knowledge of people with disabilities and, and particularly people who are neurodivergent or, or autistic. I have an autistic daughter as well. She's profoundly autistic. It would be a, it may be hard for her to be in the workforce, but I will tell you, she has a perfect memory, a perfect memory, uh, and, and such a focus on detail. And so if she was able to communicate more and be in a workplace, there are jobs that she could do. And there's a lot of individuals on the autism spectrum that need a fair amount of supports, maybe not as much as my daughter does, who could work and could add a lot of value. And there's some who may need no supports or very little supports, but they need to make sure you don't discriminate against them because they're a little different. And that's a big part of this as well. Eliminating the stigma, training people what neurodiversity is. So when they see it, they don't view it as something negative, they view it as something positive. But let's do a follow-up to that. Um, Craig, what steps should employers take to minimize recruiter and algorithmic biases 
Okay, so so you're it's a great question, and I'm curious for Scott's thoughts on this too. But I will tell you mine. Um, you're talking about humans, and you're talking about machines, and there is unconscious bias in humans, and sometimes in the area of neurodiversity, conscious bias because of stigmas and and just uh, anachronistic older ways of thinking about disability that don't fit into the what's called the social model of disability that people with disability don't have something wrong with them, that is part of who they are, that is something that they should be able to bring to the workplace, and that you should adjust the workplace for them so that they can be productive. Um, so you have that sort of bias among recruiters where they may see someone who's acting differently, or it, it could perhaps be a physical disability, maybe in a wheelchair, a wheelchair user, or it could be someone who's blind or low vision or deaf or, or, or hard of hearing, and just say, you know what? They, they may say something like, we're not going to go that way because I'm worried about risk. I'm worried that we won't be able to accommodate them. And that's a mistake. Not only is that illegal, but that's a mistake. You're missing out on someone who can add a lot of value to your workplace. And you need to be open to hiring that sort of individual that, that has a disability. Now, with algorithmic bias, the issue is that some AI, and let me tell you, I'm a big fan of AI. I believe in it. I believe that it can identify underutilized talent better than humans can, particularly when you're looking at 20,000 applications and you know that people have unconscious bias and also sometimes affinity bias and other forms of bias, confirmation bias, where they may say, oh, you went to my school, I'm gonna go after you, even if that school is not so diverse. You know, so the, you know, all of these biases exist among recruiters. AI can help with that. But the problem, the thing that you have to think about with AI though, is that if you're, if the AI is looking at how someone speaks, or how someone sounds, or how someone looks, or even sometimes their resume, how they write it, and it's not, and you're not testing that AI for bias, it's very possible it will discriminate against people with disabilities. Certainly, the ones that focus on how people sound, speak, look, whether they look in the camera, you know, their competence, or things like that, that sometimes you're looking for in a job, or sometimes really have nothing to do with the job, but you think you're looking for it. Um, you know, someone with autism may be looking down. They may be very uncomfortable with the whole process of being uh, videotaped and having to speak to that, that may cause a lot of anxiety. And yet they may do awesome when they get to the workplace with, with, with a simple accommodation or maybe no accommodation. So that's why you have to be concerned about AI. Uh, those sort of things you think you're looking for are not really job related and ultimately can discriminate against someone who has a disability. It can also be someone who has an accent. If you're looking for how they speak and, and maybe the AI doesn't pick up all the words, that could be a form of discrimination too. So there's, you know, that's why you have to be careful with AI. But in the long run, it should be helpful for people with disabilities if done correctly. Scott, I know you're, I know you're an expert on AI. So, yeah, and, and I'm passionate this space partly because I'm a computer scientist and uh, an information scientist. I know my background is atypical, even for atypicality. Otherwise, with some of my background being technology in addition to policy, and I agree with everything that. Craig says, and, and I think you have to think intentional in this space about fairness, equity, inclusion, access issues when it comes to AI and other emerging technology, artificial intelligence. Um, I posted, we're, we're going to have available uh, one of, uh, it's now showing up in chat, is a toolkit that we have from the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, Pete, PeteWorks.org, which is our Accessible Technology TA Center that is focused on emerging tech like that. And one of their practices they have emphasized, among other things, and you should take a look at that toolkit, um, is to be thinking about when you're thinking about automated screening interviews, that you could be screening folks out and making sure that not only you consider equity in relation to disability, especially cognitive disabilities, um, like autism, intellectual disability, mental health conditions, et cetera, because again, we're going to show up as outliers when you do these automated systems. We're also often not included in those data sets, right? The data sets may reflect a narrow version of the population that often doesn't uh, necessarily have us included in there intentionally. And that creates a hindrance that can lead these systems to screening folks out from job interviews. And then as Craig mentions too, it can create extra anxiety as well. If you have this automated agent, right? Doing an interview with you, how do you even request an accommodation too that you might need with this intelligent software agent that's not even a human being, right? And maybe you need an adjustment on the fly. Maybe you need you're, something's confusing or ambiguous, the agent, the software may not be able to contextually handle that in a way that a human being can. So I, I this is not to say that folks should not 
be using emerging technology like AI, virtual reality, et cetera, because that's going to be happening anyway in the workplaces here in government and the private sector. But um, I think folks just have to be thinking really deliberatively about equity issues, inclusion, access issues, and to be using resources like we have from ODEP. And I just wanted to say also briefly, I forgot to mention just in passing that ODEP is a non-regulatory, non-enforcement agency. So we are not here to count beans, or, you know, is that we are here to help as far as resources, information, technical assistance, um, outreach. So please do go to our resources, our website, everything's free, everything's here to help. We just wanna see folks, uh, attain and maintain and advance in their careers and have gainful employment that can support economic equity and community living and a high quality of life for every, for all folks, including people with disabilities. So uh, just but I put that out there because sometimes folks get anxious when they see government at times and, and they're get worried about like they're coming for this or that. And it's, it's like, we're out there here to help. Uh, we're a small agency that wants to see folks be successful, including in the private sector um, and in government. Yes, just to be clear, OFCCP is not ODEP. ODEP is the friendly part of the government. You know, I want OFCCP to be that way too. I tried, and hopefully it is. <laughs> I, I, have, I have great faith in Jenny Yang, um, who I know went to NYU, and, uh, and I know that she cares about that too, but it's still an enforcement agency. ODEP is not. And they will help you. They will help you. And if you tell them something that you're not doing so well, they will help you. So go to ODA. All right. Thank you. Okay. I want to go back to Holly um, on this overall issue of uh, attraction and, and hiring uh, neurodivergent uh, workers. Uh, because Holly has an ex uh, experience that's a bit different than everybody else on this panel. So um, overall, um, what do you see as the changes to hiring and recruiting processes that you think are likely to be successful? So I can speak to, to our program here at Walgreens. And you know, while our organization has always had a very strong commitment to disability hiring, we, we really stepped it up about 16 years ago and made our mark as a leader in this space with upgraded facilities and training programs as well as a new operating model, which we refer to as same job, same performance. And what that really means is that um, for individuals with disabilities, we offer the same job with the same expectations for the same pay. So the focus is really about providing opportunity. And this year, we really took it a step further to become the first company in the S&P 500 to include a disability representation metric in our disclosed incentive plan. So it's now a component of our bonus plan that really holds our leadership um, to this target, to um, a commitment to hiring people with disabilities. And we're really proud of that work. And we're also alongside of that introducing a new program this year uh, with our partner organization, Neurodiversity in the Workplace, um, to hire uh, neurodivergent talent within our professional roles, within our uh, corporate headquarters. Um, so this is going to sit alongside our two signature programs. Um, the first is in our retail stores, which is a three to four week uh, in-store retail and customer service training program. And we do evaluate uh, those participants uh, at the end with our Walgreens store managers and looking for role opportunities for them uh, if they complete that program successfully. Our second signature program is our transitional work group, and that is in our uh, distribution centers, and that's a 13-week uh, training and job coaching program uh, where an evaluation process also occurs, and uh, those individuals that, that meet the requirements are recommended uh, for hire. So what, the way that our program will be working that we're introducing this year in our headquarters is that qualified neurodivergent candidates would complete a technical project 
And that would be designed to showcase their skills for a particular role or typical jo uh, job category that they might be applying for, getting managers directly engaged. And this would be in lieu of a traditional interview. And alongside of that, we would also be doing training for these managers, really trainings throughout our organization. Because let's, uh, you know, the, I think the statistics we shared earlier speak for themselves. There are already neurodivergent employees uh, within our company uh, at this moment. So making sure that we're providing the training necessary uh, to create a really inclusive environment for those people we hire through this program in particular, but also for the neurodivergent um, employees within our ranks uh, today. So um, we're, we're really proud of, of these three programs we have, which touch all elements of, of our enterprise organization, and they've proves, proven to be very successful, and we've hired thousands uh, through these programs. Thank you. Um... So, Craig and Scott, from your perspective, where does where does it start when it comes to both retention and overall management? Well, I would say first, it would be very helpful um, to have a chief accessibility officer or someone who's designated to be responsible for this program. It could be a chief DEIA officer but make sure that your DI program includes neuro neurodiversity. Um, but it, you know, a chief accessibility officer or someone like that who really has responsibility for this and is reporting to the chief executive officer, that's always extremely helpful. Second, putting together a neurodiversity at work program, similar to the one that's on the EARN uh, website or even a broader one, uh, although that's a pretty good one. Uh, three, you know, doing active recruit, training, before you active recruiting, training your recruiters about autism, making sure they know what it is, making sure they know it's a spectrum, and that there's a wide range of skills, just like the general population, a wide range of skills within the spectrum, that there are some characteristics that occur in the spectrum sometimes, uh, but not always, like social anxiety, um, not, not maybe having difficulty with eye contact, maybe needing times to take a break, and I'll let Scott talk about this more because he can speak about it from his from his own experience but i will um but you know make sure that they're trained on that and then also train that neurodiversity is more than autism uh, it, it it there's a lot of different disabilities and conditions that are within the neurodiversity umbrella let them know about the social model of disability and that that's a positive thing and that the company has to meet a 7% goal if it's a federal contractor or wants to meet a 7% goal if it's not and that, you know, a quarter of the population has a disability and about 90 to 95% of those disabilities are non-apparent. And that if you really wanna reach those goals, you gotta be focused on those non-apparent disabilities, including that a mental health awareness and mental health, you know, toolkit type approach because a lot of people have anxiety and depression and are afraid to let people know about that at their work because they're very concerned about any sort of psychiatric disability stigma or stigma related to depression or anxiety, and that they'll be treated differently, not given work, um, shunned even, or, or pitied. Uh, people don't want that. They want to be included, and they want to know that they can get the supports they need. So once you do that training, and then you tell your recruiters, go out there and hire for this, also have relationships with vocational rehabilitation agencies, uh, have an ERG, like an employee resource group or affinity group for people with disabilities, build up internal stakeholders, if you have a big enough company, have a neurodiversity employee resource group with internal stakeholders who voluntarily self-identify and lead. Those are some ideas. Scott, you got some more? I know you do. Yeah, I definitely have some ideas. And I also concur with what Craig shared. And we also, and I can see if I can get it posted in chat, is we have a guide toward um, maintaining, sustaining, creating uh, employee resource groups and affinity groups actually at EARN, actually. That's one of our wonderful resources we have out there. And I'll see if I can get a link to that for a chat later. Um, but yeah, I, and I big believer in that, uh, the, the ability of ERGs and affinity groups to support the work. I happen to be the president, current president of our disability uh, affinity group or employee resource group at the Department of Labor uh, right now. Uh, and I think that can help with setting up programs. And we say programs, 
I, I emphasize with folks, you can be flexible about it to tailor it to your actual business or agency. Um, and it can be modular too, right? I mean, you can you can roll it out in different pieces. You don't necessarily have to. I, for a lot of things, I'm a big believer on go big or go home kind of thing. I think in this case for support, it's 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 really good to to have this modular, flexible, create this and create that, and then gradually sort of put the pieces kind of out there because sometimes if you go too gigantic, maybe a, you know, HR or just, you know, you run into these complexities, right? And then you end up with nothing sometimes at times. So uh, that's happened for us in government. I know it can happen in industry too, is that folks get a little overwhelmed and I say, well, you can, you can put in some mentoring, you can put in some other navigational supports, you can um, find ways in terms of if they need help with getting transportation to the workplace. You can have trainings for managers, as, as Craig mentioned, uh, that you can start doing. You can do trainings for other employees as well. And you can help folks be educated, the win-win, that there is an inclusive design, universal design element of this. Visual supports, the mentoring supports, direct positive feedback for workers from their supervisors for how to do their work. It benefits everybody having clear expectations. I mean, all these things are not rocket science. And they really help your workplaces to be able to thrive. And then there's some other supports too. Sometimes when we say the technology and folks always think it's like $10,000, $100,000. There's sometimes these low tech tools, for instance, and I'm actually holding one right now. You can't see it on camera, but I'll see if maybe I can briefly wave it over here. Is that I actually have these when I do presentations, et cetera, or in work activities as I have, they don't make any noise. There are called, called sort of stimulation type aids that help me sensory processing kind of manner, motor movement, et cetera, with hand movements to reduce my anxiety. Uh, these things are cheap. They're less than a dollar usually for, uh, I think I got these, I think they were 30 cents a piece or whatever, different colors, but they serve a vital function. And that's another example of many things out there where sometimes technology may not be that expensive at all uh, in terms of different niche tools that you can find in software and things like that that are often low cost or sometimes free and other niche supports that you can find that really can benefit folks and volunteer roles for some other workers sometimes to empower folks. And that includes getting family members, I think, involved too. And I think that uh, Holly, Craig and, and others, like um, in terms of that family member perspective is very valuable too, in addition to the perspective of folks who are neurodivergent, um, really helps empower, I think, the, the process to enliven what we're thinking about for supports and access opportunities um, and, and helps set it real concretely for what it means in terms of the impact on folks' real lives. I mean, these are folks' sons and daughters of people in the workplaces, us as humans. Um, and so I think it's really helpful. And then and then tailoring to the individuals too, rather than say saying, oh, we're gonna just only do these three or four things is to adjust and personalize and individualize to your workforce. And that means changing over time what the support set looks like for folks. Um, in my case, for instance, I've had executive function here in government, uh, executive, function, executive coaching for executive functioning and social things of the workplace. That came up on demand because I contacted the Job Accommodation Network, which, by the way, is a technical assistance center that we uh, support from ODEP that provides free expert confidential assistance, askjan.org. Uh, you can connect with and they'll help you brainstorm workplace accommodations and supports. And that was an idea that was brought up is, oh, I could talk to maybe a, a coach every couple, every week or every couple weeks. This is not like regular job coaching. I didn't need the coach to help me with workforce duties. It was more of like niche things of like, how do I fit socially in the workplace? I'm having these communication challenges. I'm having these executive functioning. When I say executive functioning, like planning, organization, niche issues contextually, what are these strategies that can help me manage those things and reduce barriers? Um, there are other examples like that where we could put things in place that can really be beneficial for folks and that you may find they benefit your neurodivergent workers so much that other folks learn about it. And they're like, can we do this as a more universal aspect of our workplace? It enhances our productivity, our performance. And in some cases it reduces complexities for mental health and stress for all workers and can help you have a more healthy, uh, and well, you know, support well-being for your entire workplace and and good workplace activities. So, you know, it's one thing I mentioned a lot, and hopefully, folks understand that is that these are benefits for everybody. The the it's things we talk about for autism or other forms of neurodivergence uh, are not necessarily just specific um, to those disabilities that are really 
helpful for making it sure everybody can fit in and do their jobs. So let's talk just a few more minutes about um, accommodations. Um, what does the law require? Barbara, I'm going to turn to you on that one. And also, we've got a question from an attendee uh, that relates to this, which is as follows. While it is likely that the law varies from state to state, can we make generalizations about the obligations that states have to make accommodations to make it easier for neurodiverse individuals to be able to perform their jobs? What obligations to make reasonable accommodations exist in federal law? Well, um, the accommodation obligation is as wide as there are accommodations out there. Um, and federal law, as has developed now over several decades, is probably more sophisticated than um, the case law, more sophisticated, more well-developed than in states. But in certain localities, like I mentioned New York, but I also know some localities in California, um, other states, the city and local laws are actually much more uh, stringent. Um, but the requirement to accommodate basically is to make an adjustment to either the job or the physical workplace to enable the individual with the disability to perform the essential functions of the job. So it's very important to understand what the essential functions are, separate the essential from the non-essential. Um, I know this is something nobody likes to do, your managers don't like to do it, but you really need to update job descriptions if not every year, at least every two years, um, and make sure that they actually match the requirements of the job. And I think more and more, we have to think about the non-physical functions of the job. It's not about walking and driving, it's about thinking, meeting deadlines. And one of the things that struck me when, when Holly was speaking is the 94% retention rate, I think is a great statistic to remind your senior executives because it's, it's all great to have these programs, but you really need to also support your supervisors because a supervisor who is being asked to hire someone who's neurodivergent or has another disability is frankly being asked to bring in someone who's going to require more of his or her time. And also that supervisor is still has to meet the same deadlines, has to meet the same quota, has to produce the same number of loaves of bread or get the same number of prescriptions filled as the supervisor in the other store. So they need to understand that they have support from the, the supervisors, the managers, from the highest levels of the organization. So you need buy-in from your senior executives. I think the suggestion, and I know I have a number of clients who have a diversity coordinator, um, that's a help because managers need to understand there's a resource they can go to when someone comes to them and says, you know, I can't work these hours. I'm going to need a break every two hours to just, you know, decompress. Um, they need to understand how to respond. They need to understand who to go to. Um, but the accommodations, it, I don't want to say it's an impossible question to answer, but it's a really broad array. And it's, it's, anything from, you know, changing the hours to changing the responsibilities to changing the physical workplace. Um, I've had people ask to be in a, in a small office. I've had asked to be a private space because they can't work in a noisy space. Um, it, it's honestly, it's, it's a very, very broad array and you have to be creative. And again, this is going to sound a little uh, lecturing, but I'm not going to lecture too much. You have to engage in an interactive process with the employee. Where I see employers make mistakes that lead to lawsuits, it's when somebody rushes to judgment and says no too quickly, someone ends up getting terminated or rejected. And then we're in a lawsuit because we haven't engaged, really engaged in an interactive process. So are there steps that employers are generally not required to take in accommodations? And also, what about standards and policies? Are there steps employers are not required to take? Well, you're not required to eliminate this is a really broad statement, but this is a broad general rule to eliminate an essential function of a job. You're also not required. In other words, you know, the most obvious is if you need to be able to, generally speaking, if you need to be able to see in order to 
perform your job. Maybe you're in security and you're at the front door of a building. Um, you're not, generally speaking, going to be able to hire someone who cannot see and then hire them an assistant who can see to perform that job. That's a really the broad generalization, but that's why it's important to, to delineate your essential functions. You also can hold people with disabilities to performance standards, as long as those standards are set fairly and reasonably, and those standards are applied to everyone. And again, generalization, if someone with a disability is engaging in misconduct, you don't have to overlook it. Um, you can subject them to discipline if they are not following policies, procedures, not behaving professionally in the workplace. Um, those are some things managers should understand so that when they hire someone or someone comes into their department who has a disability, they know, generally speaking, the limitations. And then someone in, in Holly's organization is going to be guiding them through the discipline process. It gets very tricky, very tricky. Um, challenging is a good word. So I, I, I want to move on to uh, hearing a bit about um, privacy issues and also about addressing coworkers' concerns. But that's really just a teaser for a moment. Because, uh, <laughs> All that we've been talking about, there are there's a question or two that's come in. So I think it would be timely for us to take a look at that. From a legal perspective, is one question. It's hard to prove that hiring discrimination occurred. Is there an effective way to identify hiring discrimination? Who wants to take that? Well, I will say that actually it's it's not hard if it's systemic. So, you know, OFCCP, for example, if they do an audit, they will take a look at all your hires for a job title, job group, and they will uh, inclu include only those who meet the minimum qualifications, the essential functions of the job. They meet those qualifications. Then they will run, a, well, they'll run a T-test, it's called, but they'll, they'll basically look at the ratio of hiring by race, ethnicity, and gender. And if that ratio is different enough that it's outside two standard deviations, outside of a normal distribution, it's an outlier, they'll assume that you're discriminating. And then you'll have an opportunity to convince them why you're not. And this comes up with AI too. You know, anytime you're using any sort of uh, selection procedure or even no selection procedure, you're just hiring at these different rates, you're gonna have to be worried about disparate treatment discrimination because you have more than two standard deviations. So there can be an inference you're discriminating. And even if you're not intentionally discriminating, if you're using AI or using a test or using a qualification even, it could be a lifting qualification or something, if it's causing that difference in ratio, you're going to have to justify it and basically say uh, it's called validation, but you're going to have to explain why this test is job related. So in the systemic area, the law is pretty clear and OCCP is pretty effective at identifying hiring discrimination. On the individual level, it's different because you can't really read someone's mind. So typically you're you're relying on burden shifting, which Barbara could talk more about, I'm sure, because I know she's handled cases like this a lot, but it's more of a burden shifting. You're inferring it could be discrimination. And then the company's coming back and explaining why it's not, why that person wasn't as qualified, uh, why, why, this, why there was a justified reason, non-discriminatory for the action taken. Now, every once in a while, and in the neurodiversity area, this could very well happen. You will have a statement. That person is different. That person acted in a way that I, I was uncomfortable with, or I've never seen that before. Is that appropriate for a work environment? Is there a good fit here? Things like that will be said about someone who's neurodivergent. And that could be a sign of uh, animus, or at least of intent, that you're, you're treating them differently because of their disability. So... That's 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 what I would say, Barbara. You have any thoughts? Because I mean, I know. look, the most obvious way is to uh, start with the resumes and look at the resume and of the applicant and say, was the person X more qualified than person Y? Um, and if person X wasn't hired, well, what was the what was the reason? But I think the the important thing for a company to protect itself from these claims is to train everyone who is involved in the interview process, both what 
what to ask and what not to ask. And of course, what to ask, as I said, someone said it earlier, focus on the work, not the person. It's not about where you grew up or where you went to school or you, who you might know. It's about, can you do this job? This is what we're going to ask you to do. What not to ask is not to get into anything about what might appear to be a, some difference. Um, uh, even if the person, and this becomes very, very tricky, and I've done these trainings for hiring managers, what if the individual raises it during the interview? And they say, you know, if I seem a little odd, I'm actually on the autism spectrum. Well, you've got to really train managers how to react to that. So they're not flummoxed and they don't get awkward and they don't start hemming and hawing and, and then getting into areas which they shouldn't be asking about. Because actually the answer at that point should be, gee, that's great. Nice that you told me. Let's continue our conversation. And, you know, then continue the conversation about the job. Well, let me tell you about the job and are you going to be able to do the job? But if you don't train people to how, how to react to those statements, and sometimes those statements are, are offered out by the individual because that's how they might have been trained by a job coach to get it, you know, get it out during the interview, you could end up with a very disastrous interview. I've, I've actually had situations where a manager not understanding said, oh, sorry, we, we don't hire that person you know, that, that category of people, because they just don't literally know what to say. And now you have um, a, a big problem. So training everybody who hires, not just the people in HR, but the people on the management side is really important. Well, that answer really anticipates the next question from, oh. <laughs> which is, do you favor shifting recruitment overall from interviews to skills testing programs? So anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? I mean, I'll say, I'll just say briefly, I do. I mean, I think that that's the way things are going. And in terms of how AI can be used for good, it's by focusing on skills and identifying skills from underutilized workers. So yes, I think so. And I will also tell you, and I always tell this to people, don't, don't use the word fit. You know, I hear it all the time. And particularly for neurodivergent individuals, it's used to exclude them. That person doesn't fit. That person's different. But I'll tell you, any organization where there's an overrepresentation of a particular group and someone who is in an underrepresented group, you say they don't fit, what you might be saying, and you may not even tend it, it may be unconscious, it may be affinity bias, but what you may be saying is they're different. And that could be a sign of discrimination. And so you certainly don't want to give that as the reason they don't fit. They don't have this skill. They don't have this qualification. This other person is more qualified. Those are the correct answers. Well, I'm sure I was going to put that to Holly. I'm sure in a, in a company as big as yours, you're probably doing more skill testing than you are individual interviews. Well, I don't know. I mean, I would think that would fit with your business. And Can I jump in also after you go, Holly, too? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, absolutely. No, I was going to say this, this is what we're introducing as part of this uh, neurodiversity hiring program that we're initiating mm -hmm. this year. So this is definitely a direction that we're moving in. But I will say this, this is an area that has come up this and I love Craig, the example you gave of not using the term fit. This is something that started really in the COVID era. Because when you think about individuals working remotely, when you think about flexibility needed of different individuals, this is all about a renewed focus on results and that being what matters, not the hours in which you do the work, not how you do the work, not how you relate to the work or interact. It's about the results themselves. And I think the more there is a focus on that when it comes to performance management and how we coach our managers, I think um, that is going to yield the best results. Scott, I know you've got something to add to this, but just I want I want to give Allison a moment to just get the code in for C. Oh, okay. okay, yes, yes, please Very do. Important. Yes, sorry, I'll be quickly. The, the code the code is NYU423. Okay, thank you. All right, so Scott, you have something to add. Yeah, and I just wanted to add something to add on to uh, what Barbara had, had mentioned earlier also in terms of, I, I think employers should be prepared that folks may self-identify in the interview. I will, like I'm public about my autism 
the the law protects the the person from from employers asking about disability, but it of course always allows for the 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 job seeker, the worker, to describe that and identify that stuff. We uh, folks with disabilities can do that. So from self determination kind of perspective type of thing. So um, I I think with it happening often with frequency, high frequency, I think that employers should be ready for, for both types of contexts, right? For, for folks where uh, the, uh, very frequently folks uh, may not say anything, but you know, it could come up suddenly or whatever, and uh, they should they should understand what's legal and what's not legal kind of on that. And yeah, that, I think that was a good example that if someone brings it up, you're not gonna say, you, it, it definitely would be illegal to say something like, uh, like we don't hire those folks or, or, oh, I've never seen that before. I don't think we can have that here or something like that, right? Um, but um, I think if employers are, are prepared to say, oh, you know, thanks for educating me on that. That's that's helpful. Feel free to, or like, if you want to share anything more about like you can or something like that, like that, I think is welcome and supportive and, and really meets the person where they are for that self-identification or self-disclosure. Because mm -hmm. yeah, anywhere in the process, the work uh, the job accommodation process or, or any time you're in the workplace process to offer stage anywhere, folks can always uh, voluntary self-ID, right? It has to always be voluntary uh, as far as the self-identification. And, and part of this is cultivating a culture and community where folks feel more comfortable to self-identify. And I think you're having that more frequently now uh, with these programs. You have workers uh, who, may, who, may, who have been new to a diversion at companies and agencies and working there for a long period of time, and folks didn't even know that they were there, but now they feel more comfortable to come out when, when these uh, supports and programs are put in place and say, and sometimes even say, how can I help? I want to help you help support our recruitment for other folks with disabilities, for other neurodivergent people. Can I contribute? Can I support for the ERG? And can I do something that can help uh, advance that? So I just... I hope folks are prepared for that self-disclosure element. And look, accommodation is a back and forth process. And as understand that as an employer, you don't have to give the accommodation the employee demands. Sometimes people are very demanding. I want this. I want that. It's it's a it's a back and forth. And if you can come up with a better or more appropriate accommodation that works better for your company, and you can document why you're offering that. That's that's legal too, but it's a it's a very tricky area. Um, I don't want to get off on accommodations. It could take it could take over the the uh, presentation. So um, uh, maybe ten minutes ago, I mentioned the word privacy, and uh, and I think I'm uh, in the same sentence. So, Holly, um, I think everybody here is aware of restrictions on the dissemination of information about employee disabilities and, and is aware of the ADA's confidentiality uh, provisions. But what are some issues that employers should consider in regard to neurodivergent employees and particularly non-apparent disabilities? Well, I would say uh, in terms of self-identification, that is uh, very important to us, especially how we leverage the aggregated information. Um, and we do have a self-ID cam campaign uh, that we run annually to really encourage individuals um, to self-identify, to, to make sure we have aggregated data which informs our benefits programs. It informs uh, the way that we structure our programs to meet the needs of our workforce. And we recognize that our workforce is unique in so many ways. So we really um, leverage that data on an anonymous aggregated uh, basis um, quite well. I would say that um, the importance when it comes to non-apparent disabilities and it, when it comes to neurodivergent employees um, and you know the issues that we should consider. This is to me why it's so critical, and this has come up in the conversation a few times already, that you're not just um, training the teams that have neurodivergent employees or just training HR, but you're training the entire organization. It came up before that, you know, the hiring managers need to be prepared, not just those who are participating in the program, but 
any any hiring manager could have an individual bring up um, that perhaps they're on the autism spectrum during an interview. So all need to be prepared. And it also is so critical for creating an inclusive environment throughout the organization um, where everyone feels a sense of belonging. So I think that training, that education across the enterprise is really critical to achieve that. So, uh, Barbara, how does an employer explain to accommodations to other other staff, to colleagues of the employee who's receiving an accommodation, taking into account privacy rights? Well, it really, this is going to sound like a typical lawyer answer. It really depends on the facts of the situation. If the employee in question, let's say, you know, Annie has autism. Annie said, look, I understand you need to explain to people why I'm getting these breaks or why I'm getting extra time or whatever. It's okay to share. Then fine. Then we can share with Annie's coworkers that is why she's getting these accommodations. But sometimes that person doesn't want that to be shared. And so all you can really say as, a, as an employer is, look, there's a privacy issue here. I'm sorry, I can't share it with you. If you, um, if you had an issue, I'm sure you wouldn't necessarily want me to share it with others. Um, but um, we are working with this person to help them succeed, and these are just some measures we put in place to help them succeed. Um, you really cannot disclose the. Um, the diagnosis or the illness without the consent of the individual um, who is the is the disabled person. But what I have found is most people want to succeed. That's why you have that 94% retention rate. Um, and so they will want there to be some um, sharing among their coworkers so that there's an understanding of you know why they're different and, and why they need um, and why they need these accommodations. But look, don't discount just basic jealousy. People are people and they're going to want to know why someone gets to work from home or why someone gets to leave early or why someone is getting Friday afternoons off to go to therapy. Um, so, you know, you, you do have to work with your um, employees to make them understand. Um, within the confines of privacy. It's not an easy thing. It's very tricky. All right, so here's a big picture question for the panel. How could the law better distinguish this group of workers? Should we broaden the definition of accommodations or distinguish physical disabilities? And if so, how? I have, I have a thought on that. Um, right now, the I would say the federal government itself does not really recognize neurodiversity. I mean, they have the DIA executive order. They have a task force on, you know, accommodation. And in fact, uh, Scott's on a on a on a uh, government wide task force that looks at accessibility and increasing accessibility. But they don't go to a federal agency. They don't have a neurodiversity in the workplace program. Not even OFCCP or ODEP. They just don't have them. And they have they're very underrepresented as to neurodivergent individuals who have self-disclosed. So first, the federal government, because this could be done easily by executive order, should set up a neurodiversity in the workplace program. They need to include disability in their DIA program even more themselves. Second, you know, remote work is a very interesting issue because you know, for a long time under the ADA, um, and Barbara mentioned the essential requirements of the job, saying someone needs to be in the workplace, that was considered something that a, a company or employer could insist on. Well, we've gone through the pandemic. People have done well at home. We know people can work well at home. The labor force participation rate for people with disabilities went up to record levels in part because of that. Maybe we need to rethink that a little bit for people with disabilities. Maybe unless you truly are, like uh, Barbara said, security, and so you have to be there, or the greeter, maybe more flexibility in that regard. And again, the federal government could take the lead there. And there could be even statutory or, or regulatory guidance there for people with disabilities to allow more work from home, which is a big positive for people with disabilities generally, and also for neurodivergent folks who may a couple days of the week, it may be helpful for them to be home in an environment that is more controlled. So 
you know, and maybe even more often. So those are just two ideas. I'll, I, I don't want to, I know everyone on the panel Scott's, probably has thoughts about this. Yeah, I think Scott has something to add on this. Yeah, and one thing I also want to add to is if folks, I don't know, jealousy, I don't know what the what was mentioned before, is also important for folks to understand on the law that being a person without a disability is not a protected class. Disability is a protected class. Non-disability status is not. And disability is different than some other aspects of diversity with that individualized, personalized nature on accommodations. So simply because someone is getting accommodation for their disability and you're not for your disability, maybe they have different circumstances on what their access needs are. Um, and that very that differs for each individual person. So I think that's something for folks to perspective take in and understand that, that each situation is very different for each person, each individual worker and what their strengths, their access needs, their supports and challenges are and what their job entails too and how they can support that for their job duties. It is true, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, was written um, in the, you know, was, uh, passed in, the, in 1990, and a lot of the provisions went into effect in the early 90s in 1992. Um, and yes, our model of an understanding of cognizability, neurological disability has changed a lot then. It's possible that had we had today's understanding, maybe the ADA might have been written a little bit differently, but I think it still applies very well today as it did before and even and the rehabilitation act for those of us in the federal government and in some cases like what craig mentioned for federal contractors etc in the private sector and the rehab act is even older it's 1973 it's celebrating its 50th anniversary actually this year official and birthday is in september um but i think it still work, works really well especially with the paradigm that the adjustments, if you will, can apply to any different situation. And I think that's something that is important for folks to understand. The laws, both laws are very powerful in that respect, that everything should be subject to a potential adjustment or accommodation. That doesn't mean it, it means anything huge uh, at any time. Sometimes it's really minor things that can be a win-win for supporting uh, for access for folks. But I think you go through that deliberative negotiative uh, kind of interactive process or finding out what can fit to address that barrier or challenge for, for someone. And it can include any policies or practices. I think it's a myth sometimes among employers. They're like, ah, we, we just don't do that. Well, anything, anything you do can be potentially subject to the context for a potential adjustment to help uh, worker with disability uh, fit in, including neurodivergent people, including autistic people like myself. And sometimes one adjustment that might be helpful, um, I know this isn't thought of always as an accommodation, but sometimes employers to consider too, supports where you may want to break up. Uh, I know that you're not required to remove essential job functions, but sometimes folks can do other essential job functions that maybe are not in their portfolio. And sometimes employers have done sort of customizing, if you will, saying, maybe I can have you do these 20 things and maybe Bob can do this in, or, or Susan or someone else can do this instead. I don't need you necessarily to do that, even though it's listed here. We can tailor that and adjust to make some adjustments in, in your duties to fit the things that are your strengths. I know that's a little bit newer paradigm for approaching things, but we're starting to see that increasingly, I think, from a voluntary nature from employers of thinking, how can I sometimes adjust the workplace actions to fit my employees too? So they can best get the work done, including uh, people with disabilities. And then you get better success stories as far as the, their thinking and learning to apply to the problem solving, creativity, flexibility. And again, this is where, you know, again, where Jan can come into is, is please call Jan, email them, um, it's, uh, message them. It's completely confidential. Supervisors, managers, workers with disabilities, anybody can contact Jan at askjan.org. Uh, completely free brainstorming kind of sessions. They have specialists in every kind of disability there. Um, and they're very helpful for working this out for workplace accommodations and supports and adjustments. And you can run them things by them and say, you know, what about this? What do you think can that maybe help address this issue? And they're not going to give you anything that's binding. It's more of just sort of guidance and technical assistance, but it's often very helpful, even for those of us in government who do this for a living. We connect with Jan. I mean, I connected with Jan when I started and it helped a lot for this thought brainstorming uh, interactive process on figuring out what works best to support myself and others to have success at work. And then you often get great benefits out of that as far as the success stories that we've seen uh, for enhancing productivity and performance as far as doing tasks that may have required more time before maybe, or maybe doing tasks that other people just don't wanna do. Sometimes neurodivergent people 
and other folks with disabilities are more likely to maybe jump in and sometimes do those kinds of work that fit our strengths and talents differently. And look, Scott made a very good point. I just don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. If employees are jealous, that is not a reason not to comply. In fact, it is not an excuse um, for not meeting your legal obligations. And the courts have recognized claims for harassment based on a disability. So you have to be sensitive to whether, you, and that's why the training comes in, you don't want someone to be name called or shunned or or you know treated poorly you could be liable for that i mean it's first it's just wrong obviously but yeah le that can create a legal liability so um you do have to get some understanding among the co-workers so um believe it or not we have literally three minutes left to the program craig holly final thoughts on your part that you'd like to add in this is not in response to a specific question. These are just final thoughts that you'd like to add. Well, I'll tell you, neurodiversity, that is a big issue in, and I think you've probably seen it today, in this area. And so make sure your, your attorneys are trained on that too, because you don't want general counsel saying don't do something when really you need to be doing that and you should be doing it. And train your HR. And one other point, if the EOC is watching, because you asked the expansion of the law, I'll say one last point on that. It would be very helpful if the EOC put out some guidance saying that if you have a DEIA program, that you can ask people about their disability status if it's used for their benefit. Because right now it does sort of say that, but it says you need to have a voluntary affirmative action program or you might need to. People don't have those anymore. They have DEIA programs. And being able to ask for that information if you're a non-contractor would be very helpful for companies to set up disability inclusion program. So the EOC needs to do more to publish guidance and same with OFCCP, but the EOC in particular about DEIA programs. Well, I would leave you with, uh, for those uh, out there who are considering adding these programs at their companies or enhancing their programs, I would first of all say that executive sponsorship is, is critical to get these things done. And then I would say the advice I would give would be to focus on providing opportunity and embracing an operating model where individuals uh, who are not neurodivergent and those that are neurotypical can work collaboratively and effectively side by side, both will receive benefits from this and and all will grow uh, and it creates a a corporate culture um, that truly stands apart okay we did have a couple of questions that we just didn't get to just ran out of time um, and i'm sure it won't be too much consolation to those who pose the questions for me to tell them that we also had about another five hours worth of things that we as a um, but apologies to those who questions we just didn't get to. Thank you to all of the panel members um, very much for giving us the benefit of your deep, deep experience and, um, and wisdom as to these matters. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for also for, for moderating this. I think this was a, a great discussion that we had in terms of on empowerment and supporting uh, equal access and opportunity for folks and folks thinking uh, outside the box as far as creativity and flexibility on how they can uh, have change in mindsets and perspectives when they're thinking about neurodivergence and neurodiversity in the workplace to create better companies and better businesses and better uh, agencies and just enhance workplaces in our modern digital American economy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, on behalf of the NYU Labor Center, I just wanted to say thank you to this wonderful panel. I um, agree with what Scott just said is an important discussion and we appreciate all the attendees who logged in today to join us. Um, please return your attorney affirmation forms if you need CLE by March 9th. And please visit our, um, our annual 75th annual conference on labor and employment, which is May 23rd and 24th. Uh, the agenda is online and we really hope to see you. We also welcome your feedback for this webinar. Thanks a lot.